Um, in Hebrew, Lamentations is called Echa. It means how. Uh, that's the book's first word. It's a, it's a plaintive, desperate cry of how. 1-1 one, one says, how lonely sits the city that was full of people. I mean, that's a great opening for a novel. <laughs> uh, those who teach creative um, nonfiction or fiction will tell you to open with a line that suggests much. The opening of this book is how lonely sits the city that was full of people. What a vivid picture that screams what happened. Chapter 2, verse 1, how the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. Well, this begins to fill in the picture that um, Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, even Jerusalem, Zion are under a cloud of the Lord's anger, and it's shocking. It's hard to take in for the author. And for one, says, how the gold has grown dim, how the pure gold is changed. The fortunes of Israel have been reversed. And so how is a very good title for this book based on the first word of the book. Summarize as well the shock of the author as he marvels at devastation he has witnessed in Jerusalem at the hands of of the Babylonian army. This is what has happened. The southern kingdom of Judah has stood longer than the northern kingdom of Israel. They were defeated. They fell to the Assyrians in 722 BC. But now, years later, despite that warning, despite seeing the hand of God's judgment upon uh, the northern half of Israel, They're following suit. They're following in the same ways. There is idolatry. There's a a rampant sin. God has promised that their fate would be the same if they don't change. And so now, here come the Babylonians toward the southern kingdom of Judah into the capital city of Jerusalem. Let's keep moving. The author is an eyewitness to the destruction of Jerusalem in 587 B.C., by the Babylonians. You can read about that in Jeremiah. He tells the tale. He he recalls the account of the Babylonians coming to destroy the city. You may remember the reconstruction of the temple began in 536 BC, and um, that's about 50 years later. It's not even hinted at in this book. Um, Lamentations was most likely written during these 50 years, And given the vividness of the descriptions, was probably written early, very shortly after the destruction. So I I think it's written immediately afterwards, 586, 585, something like that, given the vividness of it. The book is technically anonymous, but most have traditionally held Jeremiah to be the author. That's based in part on one verse in uh, 2 Chronicles 35, 25 that says, Jeremiah also uttered a lament for Josiah. Josiah was the first king that reigned during Jeremiah's very long ministry. But we know that, um, that Jeremiah did write lament. He wrote in that poetic form. And if this is true, then it would mean that Jeremiah began his long ministry with lament. He began serving as prophet during the 13th year of Josiah's reign and ended as he began in sorrow and longing for restoration of Israel's covenant with God. This is something of the life of Jeremiah and his ministry. I think it began, persisted, and ended with a tone of lament. He has seen God's hand lay heavily upon Israel in judgment. He has grieved Israel's sin. He grieves his own sin. We'll see as we go. He knows that God is just in judging Israel. But he says this with deep sorrow in his heart, longing for the restoration of the covenant of Israel with God and the blessings that that would bring. So what is the situation? Well, as I've been saying, 135 years after the fall of the northern kingdom to Assyria, Judah had not learned to trust and obey God. They did a little better than their neighbors to the north in Israel. Um, They had slightly better kings, sort of, but it didn't go well for them. Judah's fate would therefore match Israel's. 
One scholar, F.B. Huey, writes succinctly, in 588, King Zedekiah, with some encouragement from the Egyptians, rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar in an attempt to reassert Judah's independence. He didn't like having to pay tribute to the Babylonians, and he wanted to try to fight for full independence. Um, Here he continues, after an 18-month siege by the Babylonian army, Jerusalem was taken, um, looted, that should say, and then destroyed. Um, Many of its inhabitants were put to death, enslaved, exiled, or fled to Egypt. I don't know why there's so many typos in that one line, so just ignore that. And uh, King Zedekiah and other leaders were taken to Babylon. And you can read about that, as I say, in Jeremiah 39, uh, Jeremiah 52, 29. And this is what's happening. The prophet Jeremiah has been warning the people for a long time, and what he's been warning them about has come to fruition. And shockingly, then, Jeremiah gets a front row seat to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonian army. Now, we are in a television and internet age, and perhaps you've seen footage of military invasions into a city. Perhaps you've read accounts of things happening um, in Ukraine in the last year, for instance. Um, Things that happen routinely in uh, Africa, for instance. And the brutality of that is hard to, to think about, hard to speak about, hard to watch played out in video. But it is not just uh, like militants sitting back, sniping at each other. Uh, What you have is a horrible, unspeakable scene, atrocities committed against um, not only the men, but women and children. There is, um, it's a bad scene. There's death everywhere uh, in all of its terrible forms. Um, Not to mention um, torture and imprisonment and everything else. Jeremiah lived through this, witnessed it firsthand and continued his prophetic ministry trying to give perspective on what he witnessed and lived through there in Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonian army. So why? Why would you write that down? Why would you record such um, terrible things of, of the starvation of people holed up trying to wait out um, their uh, captors? Um, scenes of cannibalism and everything else are in this book. Why would you write that down? Um, was, was, was Jeremiah, uh, who I believe wrote this, is he merely recording history? Is he just a journalist? He thinks it's important. Does he have some uh, bizarre flair for the sad or the macabre? No. I agree with Paul House, who has written, Lamentations was most likely written to be prayed or sung in worship services devoted to asking God's forgiveness and seeking restoration to a covenant relationship with God. Far from it being a matter of cold history or journalism um, or some fascination with gore, um, I think that he was intentionally writing poetic verse, and we'll talk about that in a minute, Um, It is highly structured poetic verse. It is the most structured Hebrew poetry in the entire Bible by far. When you look at all of its forms laid out in its meter and its acrostic pattern, we'll talk about momentarily. I think that Jeremiah is writing this to bless the people who will read it moving forward, to give them perspective on the judgment of Judah, to fix their hearts on the faithfulness of God, and yes, even with a liturgical purpose to be prayed by the people privately and corporately and even to be sung together as a people, especially during their years of exile in Babylon before coming back into the land, which we've already talked about if you were here when we did our overviews of Ezra and Nehemiah. Those intervening years were painful and difficult and this would have helped give voice to their pain and grief Um, while reaffirming their trust in God. And we'll see that trust as we go. Lamentations, it's sometimes individual in tone. It's sometimes communal in tone. It teaches each person and the whole community how to appropriately lament their sin and God's necessary judgment. 
Lamentations, therefore, guides us in grieving and confessing sin to God as we ask his forgiveness and restoration. And before we go any further, I think you can pause and say, this is a very helpful book for us today. Um, Those that have spent a few decades in America and have seen the changes of the last 40 years and and the last 10 on on a curve, Um, Those who have spent that time also reading their Bibles, it's not hard to put together what seems like an obvious fact um, that we, as a nation, are experiencing some judgment from the hand of God for our sins as a nation. I think think that that's fairly manifest if you read, for instance, Romans chapter 1. And you see that some of the things that we are experiencing now, such as wide-scale sexual perversion and wide-scale homosexual perversion, um, we're not being judged for those things. Those things are the judgment. God is giving us over to what we have wanted, I say we, in the broad sense of a nation. I think that we're experiencing some judgment as a result of that. Well, what does that mean? It means that Lamentations becomes a very important book for us. It teaches us how to recognize God's judgment, how to pray in light of it, how to confess our own sins before God when we see his judgment coming for it, how to confess the sins of our nation, and how ultimately in the end to trust in God's faithfulness. Um, Very important book. Some key themes and verses we'll look at as we go. In a book so heavy with sin, grief, destruction, judgment, and despair, Its primary theme is surprising. It is hope through trust in God's faithfulness. This book teaches us to hope against all odds in a God who doesn't change and is faithful to his promise and does save all who come to him with a humble heart. That's what this book teaches us to focus on. Though God has justly judged Judah, um, though Jerusalem... Uh, and the royal palace and temple lay in ruins. Though most of Jerusalem's inhabitants have been forcibly relocated, God is still faithful, and he will fulfill his promises to Israel. But God is working on a wide timetable, and he's judging the guilty in that generation. And so this is what we'll see when we get to the, the heart of the book. Um, the heart of the book shining all the more brightly Because of the darkness of the surroundings, in that heart lay some of our favorite verses. Lamentation 3, 19 to 33, which um, I was going to read to you now, but I'm going to wait because we're going to go through this entire um, beautiful book. Go over to your final page here, a a word on the structure. Um, We have five chapters in our English Bible. That's good chapter division because what we have here is five independent poems in Hebrew. I don't mean independent as in from different sources or different times. I think they're all written by the same author. I believe that that's Jeremiah, and I think he wrote them at the same time. But he did it, if you will, as a a movement, as a a five-part poetic movement. It's five poems um, that sort of build as they go expressing grief and lament because of the destruction of Jerusalem at the hand of God's judgment. Um, It's the most highly structured book in the Bible, I think we can argue. Um, The first four chapters, which would be the first four poems, um, are are acrostics. An acrostic is, is a form that unfolds in a pattern specifically by the alphabet. Right? So it'd be like if you wrote a poem and the challenge for you as a writer was that each couplet, each two lines, the, the first word of the first line would start with A. And um, always the beauty of the sun shines. You know, I'm not a poet, but you see what I mean. And then the second couplet, the second two lines would start with the letter B. You know, before the sun rises, we think of its beauty. You see why I don't write poetry? This is... Uh, This is why. And then the third couplet would start with the letter C. That would be an acrostic pattern. And what we have here is that uh, chapters 1 and 2 and then chapters 4 and 5 are 22 verses long. And that's because there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And so it is this highly structured pattern. 
as if the writer needs help and structure in getting his pain down on the paper. The more you have felt something, the harder it is to write about succinctly. And he has witnessed a wartime reality. He has seen people die. He has seen people that he loves hurt and carried away. His heart is breaking, but he must get this down. He has a burden from the Lord as a prophet to get this lament down on paper to help people deal with it, express it, and put their hope back in God. And so I think he chooses this acrostic pattern to aid in that process and force himself into this narrow place where he can get the words out and keep them moving. It could also be a way of saying that this is pain from A to Z, so to speak. We think that way. We speak that way. It could also be because there's plenty of confession, uh, repentance, at least on the author's part throughout the book. It could be a way of saying we must lay our hearts bare before the Lord, confessing our sin and repenting from A to Z. If we would be renewed in this covenant with God. But... um, Look at this, straight across these four columns, if you uh, are listening to this, I'll just describe them. This first poem, chapter one, it's 22, three-line verses, and the first of those three starts with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The next set of three lines starts with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, etc., all the way through the 22. The second chapter, or second poem, does the same thing. But by the time you get to the third chapter or third poem, um, it's even tighter in its symmetry and in its structure. And what we have are these um, three-line stanzas, I don't know what you call that, verses in poetry, where each line starts with that letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Um, uh, Like three lines that start with A, three lines that start with B, so to speak. And so this one is the longest and the most structured. And it is in the heart of this central of the five poems that we see God's faithfulness shining through. Chapter 4 returns to something like the acrostic from before. And yet, you'll notice in the way it's represented here by Hill and Walton on your chart, that instead of three lines at a time, with just the first line starting with each successive letter, it's only two lines at a time. Almost like the, the, he's getting the pain out, but maybe it's getting harder and harder. <laughs> and finally, by the time you get to the fifth poem or the fifth chapter, things change. I should mention that all of the first four poems, the first four chapters, are using a particular meter. And, and, and there's, uh, you know... For instance, three stressed syllables in the first line and two in the next. And the meter of that was the sound of a funeral dirge to the ancient ear. Uh, This would have been a rhythmic musical construction that they used in their funeral dirges. And it would have sounded sad and sort of loping and painful to the ears of the Hebrew listener as they read this poem out loud. And all four of those first four chapters contain that. But the fifth chapter, there's no such meter. Furthermore, there's no acrostic pattern. By the fifth chapter, it's as though the chaos of this scene also takes over the poetry. Something this difficult, this chaotic, this unstructured, it's like he can hold it together no longer, and the chaos of the scene and the pain comes out in the poetry. Um, And so, again, it is a highly, highly structured poem. That's sort of lost to us in English. But I want you to know that as we go through. Um, I think I've said everything I had written here in that section. Again, the book's beating heart, which is the author's beating heart, is trust in God's merciful heart. Let me say that again. The book's beating heart, which is the author's beating heart, is trust in God's merciful heart. Indeed, as Lamentation 3, 32 and 33 says, He will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not afflict from his heart. 
Is God judging them? Yes. Has God in his providence brought the Babylonians against them as the vehicle of the judgment that he has promised? Yes, this is something that God allows in his providence in order to judge Israel for her rampant sin. And yet, this is not by God's heart. What that means is that God is not pleased with this. We have verses in scripture that tell us, for instance, that God takes no delight in the death of the wicked. This is not from his heart. Our God is gracious and merciful. This is his heart keeping his steadfast love to the thousandth generation. It grieves God to bring this just judgment against them because of their sin. So, we'll come back to its relevance for today after we have read the book. Um, But I think we have time. We're at the bottom of the hour. I want to begin reading here. I will try to refrain from stopping and commenting as I go. And so if I, Gary, you're going to have to help me. If I stop and start preaching, you've got to give me one of these. Sorry, Keep it going. Amen. Keep it going. <laughs> Say, give me one of these. Point to the clock. No, but it's good. It is a wonderful book, and I'm glad that we'll have time to read all of it together. I think we can do that in our time pretty easily. So here we go. What a vivid, gripping scene. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow has she become, she who was great among the nations, she who was a princess among the provinces, has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile because of affliction and hard servitude. She dwells now among the nations, but finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for none come to the festival. All her gates are desolate. Her priests groan. Her virgins have been afflicted, and she herself suffers bitterly. Her foes have become the head. Her enemies prosper because the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. This is why she is experiencing judgment, because of her sin. Her children have gone away captives before the foe. From the daughter of Zion, all her majesty has departed. Her princes have become like deer that find no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. Jerusalem remembers in the days of her affliction and wandering all the precious things that were hers from days of old, when her people fell into the hand of the foe, and there was none to help her. Her foes gloated over her. They mocked at her downfall. Jerusalem sinned grievously. Therefore, she became filthy. Again, why this destruction? Because of her sin. All who honored her despised her, for they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns her face away. Her uncleanness was in her skirts, meaning it was all about her. She took no thought of her future. Another reason that she sinned as she did and was judged was because Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, ignored the day of judgment. They lived on in their sin, not taking God's justice and judgment seriously. Therefore, her fall is terrible. She has no comforter. Oh, Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. The enemy has stretched out his hands over all her precious things, for she has seen the nations enter her sanctuary, those whom you forbade to enter your congregation." All her people groan as they search for bread. They trade their treasures for food to revive their strength. Look, O Lord, and see, for I am despised. It is nothing to you, all you, uh, I'm sorry, is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there's any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger as if pleading for help from passers-by. 
Verse 13, from on high, he sent fire into my bones. He made it descend. He spread a net for my feet. He turned me back. He has left me stunned, faint all the day long. My transgressors were bound, my transgressions were bound into a yoke. You see that poetic language? My sin has become that which has snared me. By his hand they were fastened together. They were set upon my neck. He caused my strength to fail. The Lord gave me into the hands of those whom I cannot withstand. The Lord rejected all my mighty men in my midst. He summoned an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord has trodden as in a winepress the virgin daughter of Judah. For these things I weep. My eyes flow with tears, for a comforter is far from me, one to revive my spirit. My children are desolate, for the enemy has prevailed. Zion stretches out her hands, but there is none to comfort her. The Lord has commanded against Jacob that his neighbors should be his foes. Jerusalem has become a filthy thing among them. The Lord is in the right For I have rebelled against his word. Notice that Jeremiah is not holier than thou. He is casting no stones that he is not willing to own. He recognizes that he himself is sinful as well. And is willing to confess that to the Lord. But hear all you peoples and see my suffering. My young women and my young men have gone into captivity. I called to my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and elders perished in the city while they sought food to revive their strength. Look, O Lord, I am in distress. My stomach churns, my heart is wrung within me because I have seen very, uh, I have been very rebellious. In the street, the sword bereaves. In the house, it is like death. It is hard to know, is Jeremiah speaking on his own behalf or speaking in the first person on behalf of the nation? And I think that the answer is yes. And I think that he is teaching the people how to grieve and how to pray. Verse 21, they heard my groaning, yet there was no one to comfort me. All my enemies have heard of my trouble. They are glad that you have done it. You have brought the day you announced. Now let them be as I am. Let all their evil doing come before you and deal with them as you have dealt with me because of all my transgressions. For my groans are many and my heart is faint. This is the end of the first poem. My transgressions. Um, He says, as you have dealt with me because of all my transgressions. Again, Jeremiah is being very clear. You know, this is no capricious God who enjoys this. Um, this is a God who promised judgment on the, the southern kingdom of Judah if they didn't repent. They saw it played out against their even more, possibly more evil and idolatrous um, northern kingdom of Israel. And yet God gave them 135 additional years to repent and they didn't. And so for their sin, God is bringing this judgment. Now here's the second poem, chapter 2. How the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. He has cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. He has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord has swallowed up without mercy all the uh, habitations of Jacob. In his wrath, he has broken down the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought down to the ground in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. He has cut down in fierce anger all the might of Israel. He has withdrawn from them his right hand in the face of the enemy. He has burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around. He has bent his bow like an enemy with his right hand set like a foe. And he has killed all who were delightful in our eyes. In the tent of the daughter of Zion, he has poured out his fury like fire. The Lord has become like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all its palaces. He has laid in ruins its strongholds. And he has multiplied in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. 
He has laid waste his booth like a garden, laid in ruins his meeting place. The Lord has made Zion forget festival and Sabbath, and in his fierce indignation has spurned king and priest. The Lord has uh, scorned his altar, disowned his sanctuary. He has delivered into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They raised a clamor in the house of the Lord as on the day of festival. The Lord determined to lay in ruins the wall of the daughter of Zion. He stretched out the measuring line. He did not restrain his hand from destroying. He caused rampart and wall to lament. They languished together. Her gates have sunk into the ground. He has ruined and broken her bars. Her king and princes are among the nations. The law is no more. And her prophets find no vision from the Lord. The elders of the daughter of Zion sit on the ground in silence. They have thrown dust on their heads and put on sackcloth. The young women of Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground. My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. My bile is poured out to the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people, because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. They cry to their mothers, where is bread and wine? As they faint like a wounded man in the streets of the city, as their life is poured out on their mother's bosom. What can I say for you? To what compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What can I liken to you that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For your ruin is vast as the sea. Who can heal you? Your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes, but have seen for you oracles that are false and misleading. One of the problems here is the failure of Israel's prophets to challenge Israel's sin. It is a problem in any generation anywhere on the earth when the pastors tell people only what they want to hear instead of calling sin, sin, and explaining that God judges sin. You cannot explain that God is a great and just God who saves sinners eternally until you've explained what sin is and called people to turn from that sin. And part of the problem is that Israel's prophets stopped doing this. Like many preachers of our day, it was much more fun to say things that people liked and be patted on the back for it. And that's part of the reason for Israel's downfall. Verse 15, all who pass along the way clap their hands at you. They hiss and wag their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty and the joy of all the earth? All your enemies rail against you. They hiss, they gnash their teeth. They cry, we have swallowed her. Ah, this is the day we longed for. Now we have it, we see it. The Lord has done what he purposed. He has carried out his word, which he commanded long ago. He has thrown down without pity. Their heart cried to the Lord. O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears stream down like a torrent day and night. Give yourself no rest, your eyes no respite. Arise, cry out in the night at the beginning of the night watches. Pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint for hunger at the head of every street. Look, O Lord, and see. With whom have you dealt thus? Should women eat the fruit of their womb, the children of their tender care? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? In the dust of the streets lie the young and the old. My young women and my young men have fallen by the sword. You have killed them in the day of your anger, slaughtering without pity. You summoned as if to a festival day my terrors on every side. And on the day of the anger of the Lord, no one escaped or survived. Those whom I held and raised, my enemy destroyed. Jeremiah had many times in his life seen great throngs coming up the hills, into Jerusalem for the festival days. And as the army approaches, he can see it. 
and remembers, and it looks to him like the great happy throngs coming for Passover, but it is not a happy throng. Um, They are singing very different songs, and they are carrying very different implements. And he says, God, you've gathered an entirely different people together for an entirely different purpose to your capital city. This is the end of the second poem. We come now to the third poem, thankfully, and You'll see when we get down to about verse uh, 21, a beautiful shift. Chapter 3 begins, I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy, though I call and cry for help. He shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with block of stones. He has made my paths crooked. He is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He's made me desolate. He bent his bow and set as a target uh, for his arrow, set me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. I have become the laughing stock of all peoples. He has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say my endurance has perished and so has my hope from the Lord. He is struggling to the degree that he is struggling even to hope in God. Verse 19 says, Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. He has come to a low point of struggling even to hope in God And yet, who is he crying out to as he expresses this? He's crying out to God. Even this line where he confesses that he's struggling even to hope in God, he says to God. God is still empowering him. God is still strengthening him. God is still carrying him along in this grief and near despair. Therefore, verse 21, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Jeremiah has no hope in Israel and her obedience to God. Jeremiah has no hope in the Babylonians. He's seen the destruction they bring. Jeremiah has no hope in himself. What can he do against an entire army, the ruling world power of the day? But something has been called to mind and it gives him hope. Look at what it is. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, and therefore I will hope in him. When all else seems lost, Jeremiah knows that he can count on the faithfulness of God who doesn't change. He is merciful at his core, and that mercy flows out like a mighty river every morning. Even when God is judging Israel for her sin, it does not change the character of God as a faithful God who saves eternally all who come to him in repentance and faith. And Jeremiah realizes that everything that's causing him pain are things that have changed for the worst. But he realizes all at once, That God never changes. And the heart of God is a heart of compassion and steadfast love. Verse 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. 
Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes and let him be filled with insult. He's thinking now of the discipline of the Lord in general. And he says, if the Lord disciplines you and you know it, this is a good thing. Because God, like a loving father, is getting your attention to bring you back. Recognize it. Sit quietly in that state. And learn from God what you can uh, as a loving father. Verse 31, For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. To crush underfoot all the prisoners of the earth, to deny a man justice in the presence of the Most High, to subvert a man in his lawsuit, the Lord does not approve. He begins listing the things that were common, no doubt from the Babylonians to the Israelites, but also within Israel. This is why God has judged Israel, because of Israel's sin. But he will also judge Babylon in time. Verse 37, who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Why should a living man complain, a man, about the punishment of his sins? Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. We have transgressed and rebelled and you have not forgiven. He's teaching the Israelites who will read his book how to pray before God when they know that their sin has drawn the discipline of the Lord. He's teaching them to confess that, to repent of it, and to trust in the Lord. 43, you have wrapped yourself with anger and pursued us, killing without pity. You have wrapped yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can pass through. You have made us scum and garbage among the people's. He goes back now to describing the scene in the streets, the desolation and destruction. All our enemies open their mouths against us. Panic and pitfall have come upon us. Devastation and destruction. My eyes flow with rivers of tears because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. My eyes will flow without ceasing, without respite, until the Lord from heaven looks down and sees. My eyes cause me grief at the fate of all the daughters of my city. I have been hunted like a bird by those who were my enemies without cause. They flung me alive into the pit and cast stones on me. Water closed over my head. I said, I am lost. I called on your name, O Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ear to my cry for help. You came near when I called on you. You said, do not fear. Another great reason to believe this is Jeremiah because his book recalls the time when he was thrown into a pit and later rescued. And he's saying, as you saved me then from a seemingly impossible situation, God, please do it again. 58, you have taken up my cause, O Lord. You have redeemed my life. You have seen the wrong done to me, O Lord. Judge my cause. You have seen all their vengeance, all their plots against me. You have heard their taunts, O Lord, all their plots against me. The lips and thoughts of my assailants are against me all the day long. Behold their sitting and their rising. I am the object of their taunts. You will repay them, O Lord, according to the work of their hands. You will give them dullness of heart. And curse will be on them. Your curse will be on them. You will pursue them in anger and destroy them from under your heavens, O Lord. He knows that though God is using Babylon to judge Israel at the moment, God is going to judge those who are acting wickedly in Babylon against Israel. Now, chapter 4, back into um, this lament, this dirge proper. The fourth poem, how the gold has grown dim, how the pure gold has changed. The holy stones lie scattered at the head of every street. The precious sons of Zion worth their weight in fine gold, how they are regarded as earthen pots, the work of a potter's hands. Well, even jackals offer the breast. They nurse their young. But the daughter of my people has become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. 
The tongue of the nursing infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The children beg for food, but no one gives them gives to them. Those who once feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who were brought up in purple embrace ash heaps. For the chastisement of the daughter of my people has been greater than the punishment of Sodom. Sodom's judgment was over in a moment. Jerusalem is suffering in an ongoing way. Um, Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment, and no hands were wrung for her. Her princes were purer than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral. The beauty of their form was like sapphire. Now their face is blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become as dry as wood. Happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger, who wasted away, pierced by lack of fruits of the field. The hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became their food during the destruction of the daughter of my people. The Lord gave full vent to his wrath. He poured out his hot anger and he kindled a fire in Zion that consumed its foundations. The kings of the earth did not believe nor any of the inhabitants of the world that foe or enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. They seemed uh, undefeatable in the past. This was for the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests. This sin was not confined to the people. It was just as prevalent in the priests and the prophets. Those who shed in the midst of her the blood of the righteous. They wandered blind through the streets. They were so defiled with blood that no one was able to touch their garments. Away, unclean, people cried at them. Away, away, do not touch. So they became fugitives and wanderers. People said among the nations, they shall stay with us no longer. The Lord himself has scattered them. He will regard them no more. No honor was shown to the priests, no favor to the elders. Our eyes failed, ever watching vainly for help. In our watching, we watched for a nation which could not save. They dogged our steps so that we could not walk in our streets. Our end drew near, our days were numbered, for our end had come. Our pursuers were swifter than the eagles in the heavens. They chased us on the mountains, they lay in wait for us in the wilderness. The breath of our nostrils, the Lord's anointed, was captured in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the nations. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, you who dwell in the land of Uz, Uh, But to you also the cup shall pass. You shall become drunk and strip yourself bare. The punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer. But your iniquity, O daughter of Edom, he will punish. He will uncover your sins. This is another hint of restoration in 4.22. The punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished and he will keep you in exile no longer. But now chapter 5, the fifth and final poem, breaks from the meter of the first four, this sort of uh, uh, rhythmic dirge, this funeral song, and it breaks from the the, uh, uh, acrostic pattern. You can even see here they're shorter verses. They come quicker. It's like the pain is just pouring out to conclude. He says this, chapter 5, verse 1, Remember, O Lord, what has befallen us. Look and see our disgrace. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our homes to foreigners. We've become orphans, fatherless. Our mothers are like widows. We must pay for the water we drink. The wood we get must be bought. Our pursuers are at our necks. We're weary. We're given no rest. We have given the hand to Egypt and to Assyria to get bread enough. Our fathers sinned and are no more. And we bear their iniquities. Slaves rule over us. There's none to deliver us from their hand. We get our bread at the peril of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Our skin is hot like an oven and with a burning heat of famine. Women are raped in Zion, young women in the towns of Judah. Princes are hung up by their hands. No respect is shown to the elders. Young men are compelled to grind at the uh, the mill and boys stagger under loads of wood. The old men have left the city gate. The young men left their music. The joy of our hearts has ceased. Our dancing has been turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. 
For this our heart has become sick. For these things our eyes have grown dim. For Mount Zion, which lies desolate, jackals prowl over it. But you, O Lord, reign forever. And your throne endures to all generations. Why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us for so many days? Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us, and you remain exceedingly angry with us. That's the end of the book of Lamentation. I'm going to give you just three ways that I think this book is very helpful for us as we consider it uh, in 2024. Number one, Lamentations helps us respond well to God's fatherly discipline. Scattered throughout the book are model prayers, humble prayers, crying out to God, confessing sin, and trusting in Him. In the book of Hebrews chapter 12, we get something very similar. Verse 3, consider Him who endured from such sinners such hostility against Himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. For it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Well, if you're left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Consider him, this is the Lord Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. You see, for God's children, his wrath was poured out in Jesus in full on the cross for your sin. When you experience the hand of God in discipline, you're not experiencing his wrath. You're experiencing his fatherly discipline to to stop you and redirect you and bring you back into fellowship with him. What do we do with that? We confess. 1 John 1, 9 says that we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God disciplines his children now so that the sin that, that interrupts his children's fellowship with him may be confessed and repented and thereby removed so that God's children can be restored to a sweetness of fellowship with him, greater intimacy with him. So Lamentations helps us respond well to God's fatherly discipline by way of confession and repentance and trust in God's steadfast love. That steadfast love, great is your faithfulness. What a wonderful hymn written uh, from chapter 3 of Lamentation. It has been expressed for us now in the highest possible way in Christ on the cross. He has died so that we don't have to. Now as his children, if we have faith in him, we come in confession and repentance and know that we are forgiven by our Father and restored uh, to full fellowship. Lamentations also reminds us to take sin seriously. Hebrews 3, going back to the left in Hebrews, a little bit in your Bible, As Christians, though we know that our sin is dealt with forever on the cross by Christ, in no way do we, therefore, just dismiss sin in our lives. No, we continue to take it seriously. And Lamentations reminds us of that, that there are consequences for sin. This is true in the life of a Christian as much as for a non-Christian. Sin still brings harmful consequences. Um, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Notice the word unbelieving. He's not saying at all that someone can lose their salvation. The scriptures deny that in the strongest possible terms. But what he's saying is that if a person walks in sin long enough, you know what that might reveal? 
that they never really believed in Jesus in the first place. When someone toys with sin and it turns into accepting sin and it turns into just living a sinful lifestyle in an ongoing way, it may reveal that they are actually an unbeliever. We need to watch out for that and be careful. He says, but exhort one another every day as long as it's called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Do you remember? One of the things that he said was that the prophets in Israel were no longer challenging sin in their lives, meaning calling them to repent. We can't do that for each other. We have to address sin, open sin in the lives of our brothers and sisters for their good. Boy, I hope that you will love me enough that if I am walking in open, unrepentant sin, they'll come and say, what are you doing? What, why would you do that? Don't you know that that's going to hurt you? It's going to hurt your wife. It's going to hurt your kids. It's going to hurt this church family. I mean, you won't have that opportunity because the elders, you know, will have acted quickly. And, <laughs> you know, you'll be coming to me, you know. But, but you get my point. Um, this is what we must do for each other as Christians if we see open, unrepentant sin is say, hey, what are you doing? This is bad. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Here we're talking about Israel's rebellion against God in the wilderness because God literally had just led them out of Egypt and they immediately rebelled against him. But they were in a similar rebellion later when God disciplined them with the Babylonian army. And so we need to learn our lesson from this and not live in rebellion against God thinking that it's just okay. It's not. At the least, it's going to draw the fatherly discipline of God in our lives until we repent. At worst, it may reveal that uh, we never truly believed in the first place, according to Hebrews 3. So Lamentations reminds us to take sin seriously even as God's children. Finally, Lamentations teaches us to focus on God's mercy and faithfulness in the midst of painful, even cataclysmic circumstances. Turn back in the Old Testament, Habakkuk chapter 3. Um, this is one of the minor prophets. We preached through this book a couple of years ago. Is that right, Brent? Two years ago we did Habakkuk in the evenings? 18 months ago. And so... Um, the end of chapter 3, this is describing the same thing. Habakkuk has been given a vision of the approaching Babylonian army and their destruction of uh, Judah and Jerusalem. And he can't believe it. And uh, he's crying out to God, asking God, uh, is there anything that can be done? God says, yes, there is. He cries out first about the sin in Israel, and God says, yes, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. In fact, I'm going to bring the Babylonian army against you. Then he cries out and says, no, God, you can't do that. That's not justice. Are you serious? And God says, yes, I am going to do that. And yes, it is just. Yes, it is just. But you know, at the end of all this wrestling with God, Habakkuk says this, and Verse 16, chapter 3, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me because he had been given a vision of exactly what Jeremiah saw and described to us. Literally bodies in the streets, people turning to cannibalism to survive as they're walled up, hiding. He says, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. I will wait for God to judge them as well. He knows that God is a just judge. And here's what he says, verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flocks be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's, and he makes me tread on my high places. Like Jeremiah, Habakkuk came to the place of recognizing that God is faithful to his word. He had promised to judge Israel in this way if she continued on in their idolatry. Idolatry, which, by the way, and often included child sacrifice. I mean, Israel got, I will punish you for that. In fact, I will destroy you and send you out of your country. 
And so God, true to his word, did just that. But also, God, true to his word, saved all those who cried out to him in repentance and faith. Now, they were carried off with their fellow uh, countrymen, and yet God forgave their sins. They have been rejoicing with him now uh, for the last 2,500 years in his presence. And we will meet them. We will ask those that trusted in Yahweh, trusted in God at that time in his provision of a Savior. We will ask them when we get there, what was that like? What's it been like the last 2,500 years? You see, God is faithful to fulfill every promise. And he's working on a very big timetable. And what that means is, as our nation continues to turn, as our nation continues to drift, one, we need to cry out. We need to confess our own sins to God and repent. We need to confess the sins of our nation and repent and ask God if he will cause our nation to turn and lift his hand of judgment. But if things get worse, not better. Even if they get really bad, we can cling to passage, to books like um, Habakkuk and like Lamentations to learn how to keep our eyes on a holy and righteous God who has provided salvation through the cross of Jesus Christ and holds 